Oops. Hey, Popcorn Junkies! Popcorn Junkies, hi! Possibly one of the last of 2023. Oh, don't say that. But a, a crucial one to do this, Maestro, because of course I think it's going to be featuring in a lot of people's top films of the year, or maybe not, maybe bottom films of the year, who knows? Or well, may, maybe an Oscar contender, who knows? So, well, I think it's certainly going to be nominated for all sorts of stuff, but uh, we're at that time of year where everyone's talking about their favourite films of the year, and, and, you know, it was incumbent on us to get Maestro in the bag, I think, yeah. before yeah. before the big, before the psych of time comes down on 2023. So Maestro, Maestro, mm. uh, this mm. is the new film directed by Bradley Cooper, um, starring both Bradley, Bradley Cooper, Cooper. <laughs> and Kerry Mulligan. Um, in a film about the life of com conductor and composer Leonard Bernstein. Bernstein. <clears throat> well, first of all, before we get going on this, Leonard Bernstein. Mm. Um, well, what was your what's your sense of him? He's far more your generation sort of yeah. name, isn't he, than, than mine even? Certainly not younger people's. For start, I always knew him. I mean, I played a piano those days, but I always knew him, of course, as a conductor rather than a, a composer. Right. And one of the main reasons I knew him so well in that was West Side Story, because I got piano music, everybody was talking about it. And I didn't realise that he hardly did any, he actually hardly composed any other stuff. Yeah. It was mainly conducting. And then the next knowledge I had of him was through Jim. Mm, friend of ours. A friend of, so, mutual yeah. friend of Mark and mine, who was really into classical music and used to listen to him all the time. And he used to be specific and say, if Bernstein is conducting, it's much better. Obviously, coming into this, the, the whole sort of genesis of this film in the first place is, is a bit of a story, isn't it? It was originally going to be Martin Scorsese who was going to make this, then he... he pivoted and then went on to make The Irishman, which is why he's one of the exec producers on this. Um, Spielberg picked it up off Scorsese, was then going to do it, but then at a screening of A Star Is Born, was so impressed, Spielberg handed the baton. So imagine having something that was going to be directed by Scorsese, then by Spielberg, and then it's handed to you. There's Bradley yeah. Cooper, um, and, uh, and and that's that's no no mean feat really to, to have them hand it no, on to you. No, 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 it's a big deal. And of course he's got directors chop, directing chops, because of course we were all fans, weren't we, of A Star Is Born. Yeah, exactly. Which Bradley Cooper obviously directed with him and Lady Gaga. Another huge, in a sense, uh, you know, sort of story that was sort of doused and soaked in music and, and the music industry, but much more the kind of country music or rock music. So Kerry Mulligan, huge fans of. Obviously, the last thing I can think of that she was major in was Promising Young Woman. Loved her in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a fan. I do like, I have to say I, I like Kerry Mulligan. I, I think she's always she always bags a very nuanced and subtle performance. Yeah, she does completely different parts in things and she always seems good, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah, 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 she does. I always resist it when I feel like I'm being told I have to like something because it's going to be big at the Oscars or it's going to be big on the award circuit. So yeah. Sometimes if that message is coming through a bit too strongly, it, I, I get a bit kind of teenagery about it. I'm like, no, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to yeah. watch this because you're telling me you're telling me I ought to. It was really hard to get me over the line to kind of go, oh, yeah. Right, yeah, 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 I'll watch yeah. this. But what about you? Were you keen on this from the get-go? Well, my, my genesis, if that's the right word, of this film was that I went to see it on my own in the cinema, first yeah. of all. I felt very strangely about it because I felt that there was something wrong with it, but I couldn't put my finger on what it was. Right. And consequently, when I knew we were doing this review, I watched it again because, of course, it's on Netflix yes. now. And I still think there's something wrong with it, but I can probably verbalise it better than oh. I could then. Oh, OK. One thing I have to say from the get-go, it's sensationally shot. I mean, yeah. there's, there's not a shot, an image, a sequence, really, that isn't beautifully considered, meticulously sort of set designed. Or, or thought about in terms of, you know, era, in terms of age, and in terms of the grade and the shift that, you know, this film shifts constantly, as it does in the trailer, from black and white to a sort of grainy 1960s colour through to almost what I call the, the colour of um, magazine supplements and that kind of stuff, you yeah. know. I, I felt it yeah. was doing something visually not entirely dissimilar to what the film Blonde did, re Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. I, I thought it was yeah. kind of, it was it was leaning into the images because, you know, there was a particular shot of him conducting at one point where on a long lens with his back to us and the, and the orchestra in front of him, obviously. And that depth of focus, I remember seeing that image in, in a, in a, in a colour supplement at some point. So I thought it did a similar thing to Blonde in which it invoked our memory of those coffee table magazines where we would have seen images of Leonard Bernstein. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, then, and then sort of used them to sort of articulate certain moments in his life. So, so I didn't have a quibble. I, th I think from the beginning to the end, it was always visually interesting. I mean, some people are saying you used black and white at the beginning 
to represent black and white that was there in the cinema in the beginning and then turned to technical or whatever as the time went on. I have no idea whether I think that's true mm. or not, but it was the end of the film was colour, wasn't it? Well, um, yeah, but so having said it looked beautiful, I think I had a major problem with this film in the first five to ten minutes. And I think it stemmed out of almost the rigidity of how beautiful it looked. I, I was really surprised by how long it took this film to get to a place where I felt like we weren't getting a very formal, plummy performance from both him and her. I, I found it really quite two-dimensional and a bit plinky plonky and a bit kind of, hey, well, here we go, absolutely. It, was, it felt like I was watching an old fashioned movie. I know what you're saying, but in a way, I felt the distinct opposite in that I, I became much happier as the film went on because the beginning of it all seemed to be jabber, 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 very fast, very smart, very um, banterish, um, without without pause, really, in a way. Mm. And um, it, it actually drove me a bit mad. It was almost like it wasn't. It wasn't giving it any space at all. It just felt yeah. very sort of conventional. And I felt like it, I couldn't, at first I thought it was a pastiche. At first I thought he was doing um, a sort of, uh, a sort of satirical kind of, some creative choice or decision to kind of make this feel like we were watching, I don't know, a Douglas Sirk movie or some melodrama from the kind of, from the 50s or 40s. And so consequently, and I felt like I was almost at times watching, I don't know, an Orson Welles film, Citizen Kane or something like that. And so I struggled to kind of then find any emotional truth in it. Because like you say, it was cracking along yeah. with, oh, yes, yes, yes. oh, absolutely. Da, da, da. And there was a sort of frenzy. And I guess what he was going for was a musicality to the editing, a discordant yeah. kind of almost, you could argue that the beginning of this film is the equivalent, uh, the filmic equivalent of tuning an orchestra. And so you've got yeah. all these discordant parts that are sort of making this noise. Yeah. And then it sort of settles. I do think he was trying to create in the edit and in the pacing and the structure. And I do think he was trying to almost mirror orchestral movements. Oh, okay. Um, I think that was helped. Thought of that. Well, it was also helped by his use of music, uh, you know, within the peak, within the sequences as well. But I, I found yeah, it, I found it distractingly. Um, what's the word? Sort of distractingly formal. I, 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 you know, as they fell in love, I found it too twee. I found it twee. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would absolutely agree with that. So I found her really sort of jolly hockey sticks, even though you know she was from Chile. Um, I found him. I found his voice. Almost, almost so nasally that I sort of thought, oh, I don't, I don't know. I didn't feel any of their sort of burgeoning relationship or flourishing romance was real. It just felt, I thought we were, I felt like it was a series of montages. And then when we got to the moment where was it on the town or there was a sort of they were doing yeah, the dancing the town, sequence the and dance, then suddenly yeah, they're both yeah. in it. They were both dancing, and I was like, oh my god, I can't bear this. <laughs> okay, um, I quite like that bit. It was, it was a. It, it, no, I quite like that bit. Well, what did you think this of their what, what did you the, think of their relationship at the beginning? What did you did you yeah, buy into well, the romance? That's that's why I'm saying it was totally built on banter, right? Smart, smart, cracking dialogue between the two of them, as if they'd known each other all their lives. Yes. Um, there was no sort of like idea of them getting to know each other or a sort of romance in a romantic way. There was no all. sexual frisson, was, was there? Sharp, sharp, sharp. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there was no sexual frisson either, was there at all? No, no. Except for these odd, I mean, and that wasn't a sexual frisson, but these odd games that they'd play where they'd sit back to back and think of a number and then, you know, whatever. I just felt, felt all their, all their start of the romance was totally... Yeah, that's what you're saying, isn't it? Unbelievable. Yeah, it's yeah I, unbelievable. I just thought I found it very prim and very proper. And so I didn't feel that there was any sort of ragged or jagged or kind of, I didn't feel there was any sort of, I didn't get anything real from it. Now, I don't know whether that Reality. was a choice. No, no. I, would I didn't see, yeah, there was no gritty romance. Like I couldn't see what she would bring to him. I couldn't see what would have made him reach out to her. And I, you know, I, I suppose I could see what she was drawn to. But then I suppose what you're asked to think is that given that he has this sort of, you know, he's, he, I mean, he, it feels that he's gay. Uh, but in a marriage rather than bisexual. I mean, I, f I feel that he's a gay man. I mean, I, and I, ne I never thought that. And, you, you know, from what you've said, it was well known about his bisexuality. I knew nothing about his sexual lifestyle or, or anything. But that was, I mean, that was really in a way because you couldn't call yourself gay in those days without right. losing your career and losing everything. But in terms of, I suppose you could argue that the reason that their relationship, their romance was only on a level, a sort of, you know, surface level, was because actually he wasn't feeling anything that deeply. You know, all of his kind of passion was for all these young men that were coming into his life. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I thought given that that was clearly true, because 
I thought what the film did show was was his passion for these young men. It, he was much more relaxed. He seemed to be, you know, patting their bottoms and being mm. much more sort of like physical. Mm. Um, and then with her, but 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 there did seem to be a sort of something growing between them. Mm. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but then, but then the time structure of the film took over, and they suddenly went from, um, you know, just knowing each other to that being married and then having all their kids and all of that. And the mm. time structure of the film, I found quite difficult. It was sort of fast. I mean, it's a film about their relationship. Um, yeah. It's a film about him being the introverted artist versus, versus the extroverted artist, about the showman, the conductor, versus the creator, you know, the composer, uh, his conflict with that. It's obviously, it's all about the double lives. I mean, I think, you know, he, he was defined by these contrasts. Well, he, he would have almost bipolar highs and, and, and sort of moments of great sort of, you know, doubt and lows. Um, and she she sort of became this kind of, you know, and I think this happens to happen to so many women of that era. I mean, like she says it at one point when they're going through a bad patch and she's had gone on a date with someone else. She says, oh, I think this seems to be the type that I attract, doesn't it? Men who are yeah, men yeah. who are drawn to other men. And so, you know, I, I felt for her. I, I think I think what I was surprised by was the fact that I found with the except with a few exceptions throughout. And I, w I do want to talk about those exceptions. I found his performance a little bit too caricature -y. I found, not caricature that's not right, but I, I found him, I found him just quite annoying. And, and I'm not, I'm, yeah. that's not to say that's not what he was like, but I found him, I found it very hard to kind of warm to him. Well, he was sort of, he was known and obviously they show him as totally brilliant and yes. taking over every sort of conversation he was in and coming sweeping into rooms and everybody, I mean, you know, to listen to, to, the history of him and everything and he says he was wonderful company and all of this well, I can see but that, he, yeah. he was a bully in a sense he was a mm. sort of i mean he expected people to listen to him mm. and he expected her to his way or the so, highway exactly i mean i was hoping it was going to explore a little bit more in that into, or, or delve into the kind of you know her being a performer the the sacrifices that she made versus versus the ones that he didn't have to make i didn't feel it went there in enough detail i mean it's no there's it's a mentioned. tiny bit on yeah. that wasn't there where she was helping him and also i didn't realize that at the time that they met that she was almost well i think no she actually was a bigger sort of star than he was yeah and and um and then she let all that go to sort of support mm. him mm. i thought it would be a film about music it's not it's about a marriage hmm. and um well that's what i was going in for was a film about a marriage oh yeah well i, I wasn't yeah. i thought i thought it it would be i thought it would introduce me to all sorts of music that i didn't know that he'd written because i only knew west hmm. side story well it was um, interesting they had one sequence when they used the interestingly i thought of all the moments where they used his supporting music as music for scenes it was the most in appropriate music for what they were showing it felt it was odd. yeah yeah and also and, and it clearly that fact bothered him didn't it, it bothered yes. him that yeah. he was only um uh, he, he, felt he, he, enough. he felt he hadn't produced enough he felt he hadn't produced enough i mean apparently for 12 or 13 years that leonard bernstein was best known for in the states was that he had this program on music for young people on every day on tv and that that's what people knew him for that wasn't made anything of because it gives it gives you an understanding of the fact that he, why he was so huge. I think what this film established was he was yeah. he was more successful and more famous, and his celebrity and his reputation was attached to him being a showman, um, yeah. which is what a conductor essentially is. Yeah. More, more than the create, you know, the private internal strife-driven creator. And I thought the most interesting part of the portrait that Bradley Cooper gave us was this idea that most of his energy was thrown into that Patrick Suskind perfume idea that he wanted to be loved by everyone. And in that, in yeah. that, and in, in the exhaustive process of doing that with all of this energy, all of this being all things to all people, all of these parties, all of these people, the bohemian lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. He was essentially sort of, you know, burning the candle too hard, you know, at both ends. And it was, and yeah. it was distracting him from the ability to actually create. I, mean, I thought there was a really, I thought it was a really powerful moment when he was working on one piece of music and he sort of walks into the lounge and he says, hey, an announcement, I've finished. I mean, I mean, again, oh, yeah. you know, hugely egotistical, like he's the only one in the house doing anything of any significance. And the way she ran into the garden, then ran into the pool, jumped into the pool, and then we have that really, really powerful shot of her just sat at the bottom of the pool. Yeah. I love that as a sort of non-verbal kind of, because I read into that both a sort of relief that she felt, but also she needed a release herself from, you know, having lived probably in this pressure cooker of creativity. Yeah. 
you yeah, know, absolutely. I felt we could have done with, I mean, again, it's always difficult knowing that the Bernstein, Bernstein estate were behind this, you know. I wondered whether they had to tiptoe around some really awkward things. I think they stepped towards the idea that he was, you know, he was a serial kind of philanderer. I mean, he was, he was, he yeah, was, they he did. was they promiscuous. Did. He was. Yeah. He and, was. I, and I, but I also wonder what the extent to which, you know, he was perhaps a bit darker in his control of their relationship and a bit more sort of, you know, would have taken her for granted and stuff like that. So, you know, there were... And in his relationship with the children, of course. Well, I thought that was an incredibly powerful scene between him and, is it Maya Hawke, Ethan Hawke's daughter? Yeah. Where yeah. He, she said, is, is there any truth to the rumours? And he lies to her. Yeah. And, and I thought there were some moments, it was a really odd film, where there were some really, really standout moments where for me, that I was saying to Nadia earlier, the strongest points or moments in this film are often talking head moments, where yeah. I thought the most interesting discussions happened. Like the, there was the interview with him where he talks about the introvert versus the extrovert and all that. There was the moment between him and his daughter where she's really pressing him on whether the rumours are true and he essentially lies to her and we're, we're fully on his face for that and that was very powerful. And then there was yeah. that particular scene where um, Kerry Mulligan, she challenges him and says, you're a hateful person, this is all about about you you have only hate in your heart you don't have you know care or kindness and I thought wow what you know there were some moments and scenes and discussions in some of these sort of talking head moments which I thought was so really well written and, and really well performed my frustration was with a lot of them they were held on such wide shots you never got in there to see them and then and then she goes and dies well I mean it's sort of like they didn't give I felt in terms of her just being his wife and giving yeah. him nothing, no agency or anything. Mm. It was a classic sort of pre-feminist sort of sort of film where, despite her being incredibly talented and bringing up these children and everything else, she just wasn't given anything to do. And then suddenly, when we started paying attention, she got incredibly ill. Mm. I thought there were a couple of standout moments acting-wise that she did when she was ill, mm. which was. Um, you know so sort of oh i thought it was beautiful when she wanted to hug her daughter in bed and yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and um yeah well but but playing devil's advocate maybe that's what she ended up being you know maybe maybe her life was that maybe she was just this prop and this second thought and you know this idea i mean there were lots of shots in there to suggest that was she was she in his shadows or was she the light that kind of allowed him or was she you know that old adage you know behind every great man there's an even greater woman you know keeping things going i have to say i thought she was sensational i think i think yeah. i really enjoyed watching her performance across time i don't think she was helped by the great big jumps in time i think they were quite no. I I think in terms yeah. of chronology, it was quite blunt. You think about the prosthetics. It didn't get in the way at all. No, no pun intended. It didn't get in the way yeah. at all at all for me. And I mean, I, I thought it would. I mean, I, I had real fears going into this because I felt he looked, and this, this isn't just good, I felt he looked in the trailer. He just, it didn't look like, I, it was, I couldn't ignore it. But I don't know, I don't know how much of that was because of all of the press and everything else. No, I, I, I felt, I felt he owned the performance. He owned the role. I didn't feel it was a sort of an add-on, if you like. Um, I, 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 if I had a major problem with this performance, it was his voice, and I'm, not, I'm pretty sure that was his voice, but it felt too performed. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen a couple of interviews with him, and he spent six years, obviously, learning to conduct, but also working on the voice, because apparently his Leonard Bernstein's voice, as we could see, changed totally. It went deep. Mm. And, um, and I thought there was far too much emphasis on that. I can bypass the how lifelike or truthful the voice is. I could have done without less of the voice and I could have done with just more of whatever his reality was. Because it, 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 it was like a bad, it, it was more, for me, it was more invasive and obstructive than, than any nose issue was, was yeah. his. In fact, I spent most of my time looking at his face and her face thinking, wow, the prosthetics are really good. I just found them both really formal. I found the whole thing oddly formal. And although it looked beautiful, because it looked so beautiful in a very formal fashion, the whole thing served to just hold me at arm's length. So I didn't have a particularly strong emotional response to them falling in love, to him betraying her, and then to her falling ill. I didn't feel as much as I thought I would from these two actors. No, I, I agree with, absolutely with what you're saying. Well, how did you feel though? I mean, I felt in a way the sort of heart of the whole film was that a six minute in thing in Eli Cathedral, mm. which was the Marla. Now, I don't like Marla, and I really didn't like that piece. And um, so it didn't work on that level for me at all. I found that interminable. And did you? Oh yeah, I mean, you like, you like Marla? Yeah, I, was it Marla? I thought that was his own mass, no. wasn't it? I thought no. that I thought that was his performance of his mass, or was that Marla? No, it was Marla. Oh right, well, whatever that yeah. final performance was, where they almost played it in real time, and yeah, yeah he was sweating minutes. buckets. That was his. That was his. Um, 
Oh, what's her name from Tar? What's the, what's she? That was his Kate yeah. Blanchett moment where he was whacking his head around and he was, you know, they, I've here's a problem for me. I've always found conductors really icky and eggy. I've always thought, oh, you're giving it too much. I don't believe you. So to watch an actor play a conductor, I find it really difficult. I, I'm just kind of like, oh, it all feels like affectation. He gave it some welly. He was sweating like mad. And it was, you know, clearly powerful, real. He'd gone for it, did it. But I wasn't touched. No, I wasn't. At all. In fact, I was I was the opposite. Of that. Yeah. I mean, I actively... I'm annoyed. I, mean, I love classical music, but I was I actively disliked that, that yeah, little piece. Yeah, and clearly we, we were supposed to make a lot of that. I mean, mm. and it was obvious that the way they'd set the cameras up, the way that mm. it went on for so long, it was a big deal. Yeah. And, and it was a big deal in his life and it was a big deal to Bradley. But I hated it. Mm. And being as that seemed to be the sort of, was it like sort of the, it came at the end of the second act. We were leading up to that. Mm. It was disappointing, mm. man. Mm. I mean, it was disappointing. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree. find... For saying it was a, and I know you're saying, and I know that he was a conductor rather than a composer, but except for one line of West Side Story, I couldn't find any music in it that I liked at all. Wow. Because a lot of people are yeah. saying, oh, wow, and, and then you've got the soundtrack. Wow. Uh, I, I have to say, I thought this was not as inventive or as emotionally gritty as I was expecting it to be, especially given what he'd, he'd given us in A Star Is Born. Admittedly, it's a different musical genre, different kind of, but in a sense, you're dealing with drug taking here, you're dealing with, you know, a mental health problem, you're dealing with, you know, you know, hidden sexuality. So you've got all the right kind of ingredients. I was expecting this to, to get, I thought we were gonna start very formally and what was gonna happen across the film was stylistically, it was gonna get a little bit more edgy. I mean, I suppose you could argue there was a little bit of that if you think of the last final scene of him dancing in the nightclub and you've got you've got this sort of odd image of a man who looked like his prosthetics was melting at that point, yeah, dancing to, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know what he was dancing to, but you know, him, him sort of feeling freer now, in a sense, now that she's died. But it, it well, did- Well, also the, in the, in feeling freer in the sense that the time had yes. gone on a bit. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't even feel it was a film, it didn't make that point directly enough. If this was a film about fundamentally how a great man had to, you know, had a marriage that was tragic and distanced and unfortunate because of the times, you know, which will have happened for so many men. I didn't feel, not that it needed to hit that message on the nose, but it, it didn't explore it in any sort of particularly original or interesting way. No, I, I entirely agree. It needed to. It needed to, yeah. didn't you think? Yes, yeah, so I don't, I mean, then the, I don't really know what it's about. Was, you know the guy that he's with at the beginning and that, um, you know, is with him all the way through, the guy that's with his wife mm. and that he says to him, I've slept with you mm. both. And, um, and that was supposed to be funny. And I um, wanted to slap him. He was, he was and reading about him in real life. You know, he was really important in his life. And you could tell every time he looked at him, you could see in Bradley's, Bradley Cooper's eyes that he felt a lot for him. It was so like flickering. It was so sort of like of a second. It was always an afterthought. I mean, you've made a really yeah. important point. I mean, if yeah. given the importance of his hidden sexual life and, and sexual orientation, there was no substance given to any of his relationships with any of the men other than the fumbling in a corridor. Yeah. Then, yeah. So you've got no moments between any of them where they talked about what they felt for each other or how no. there was a moment of freedom. Now, maybe again, Leonard Bernstein's estate wouldn't didn't want it to go that way out of respect to their mum to the wife yeah but that's where yeah. I think these these films become a bit unstuck is that you'll we'll never be able to quite know well have we got the full story I mean I you know I'm sure it must have been a much muckier uh emotion yeah. emotionally muckier and complicated process than what was given to us it all felt too clean it all felt too yeah polished and, I, and exactly and it's like you've often said about when families get involved in biographical films is they cl they've cleaned it up yeah, I'm exactly. sure of it I mean, if you read some of the stories about Bernstein and that guy in particular, I mean, some go as far as to say he was the love of his life. He, right. stay, he was. You wouldn't have got that from the film. No, he no, wouldn't. No. There's one scene where he, he, he's, he's conducting something and he looks straight at him and not his wife. Mm. And, and she clearly felt that. Mm. And also, yeah. and also, there were no moments. So there was no depth given to any of his male relationships. So you got no. No, you got nothing other than what you caught from her point of view down a corridor, pretty much. Yeah. And then there was no real kind of substance given. There were two moments where she said, "You know, people are talking." But what yeah. are you telling me? There were no other conversations between the two of them about this. 
Or, or even if there weren't more conversations, given the times, could we have not had yet more sort of slightly more stressful, complicated moments, like when she was in the royal box and he was holding the guy's hand and she looked out? Yeah. I just felt it didn't quite know what it was trying to do. And, and so you're right. I think it ended up feeling like a bit of a, what's it called, a sort of photoshopped version of his life and their marriage. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that would be because... He wanted, Brad, he wanted the approval of the family and got it. Of course. And he wouldn't have done it if it had made any more of a big deal, I don't I agree. think, of, I agree. of the relationships. OK, well, let's score yeah. it. So what would you score it, Mum? It's so weird because, you know, you see a film and I knew that I wasn't happy with it, but not why. And saw it again and really, if anything, I could say, dis maybe dislike is too strong a word, but <laughs> it didn't speak to me at all. Right. And that was seeing it a second time. And often you see things, don't you, in a film a second mm. time. I would give it, I wouldn't give it 50, Mark, I'd give it 48. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I would have thought, you know, for you of that generation or a similar-ish generation, you having, in your own life, to having had to sort of hide your sexuality, I mean, it presumably, I mean, it just, I've not had to do that, but it, for me, I didn't feel like it touched any of the complexities of that. No. At all. No, it didn't. It, it, showed, didn't. it, showed, the, it showed the mess of him doing it, it showed the mess yeah. of him being caught and being seen doing it and the rumour mill. Yeah. But it didn't explore it at all. And it felt like a major kind of om omission in the whole in the whole thing. Yeah, I felt like I could feel the family sitting there sort of analysing it and mm. not wanting Bradley to go any further. Because there's a point where she says, "We more or less, we had a deal. Mm. We had a deal, didn't, doesn't she? Mm. And then you've overstepped the mark sort mm. of thing. Well, and, yeah, um, and when she said that's a really I good point, when she, but as when, far as he could go, but when she said we had a deal, I, I, I found myself wanting to scroll all the way back and go, did we hear this? What, what deal did the, did we did I miss the deal being struck? Well, that was when she said, "I know you. I've always known you." And uh, that was that was all we got. Oh come on! Yeah, okay, I yeah. think I think I would probably give it. Uh, oof, God, it's a hard one, isn't it? Um, it certainly didn't work in the way that Star Is Born did. It didn't feel emotionally uh, sort of rigorous and complicated and, and you know for everything that was happening here there was a huge amount of emotional mess and it all felt very neat and i think yeah. the style of shooting amplified in a sense that neatness even more because it was pristine and it just needed yes. to it needed to shake it up a bit and not be quite so the crown netflixy perfect um, yeah, that's absolutely true, Mark, actually. I hadn't yeah. thought of it in those terms, but yeah. And I think there was one moment where the camera went a bit more handheld at one point, and I was thinking, oh, that, yeah, this kind of needed some really thoughtful kind of ideas about changing the, the manner and tone of the camera work, because it's, you know, beautiful drone shots over kind of silky trees, and it was all just too... It was too meticulous and pristine. It was... And what was and going... And also those things, very clever sorts of the camera scenes where something would be happening and the camera would swoop down and they'd be walking the, away from where they, they'd yeah. been, you yeah, know, yeah, those yeah. clever tricks. Absolutely. And it all looked sumptuous. It looked absolutely yeah. sumptuous, but yeah. with no, you know, basis to it at all. No, I agree. And as I say, there were a couple of moments in there where, you know, they clearly, you know, when we were just sat on his face, just sat on them both talking, that was when I was most drawn in. I found I could have just done with more. I wanted more about how they were relating to each other and what the contradictions were and complications were instead of, you know, charging on to the next sort of change in time and change in era and a new a new aspect ratio and a new colour chart for us to film in this colour. I was like, hang on, I just want yeah. to bed in. I want to understand what's going on for her here, what's going on for him here. You know, her sudden one minute she's at a table having going on dates with other people, the next minute she's back with him. I mean, it was it just didn't feel clear. Um, no. And and also even the kids weren't particularly explored. It, you know what what how did that daughter feel when it was clearly he'd like clear that he'd lied to her. You know that sort of sense of betrayal and and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So I, I, I just felt it didn't. There were so many places it it felt too afraid to go towards to step towards. And I think precisely yeah. as you say, it's because he needed the agreement of the family to to not go there. Um, so I I think I'd give it probably something pretty similar. I, I think I'd give it. 40 just for to be different 49 but i'm pretty much yeah. in the same ballpark as you 49 out of 100. yeah i mean yeah. in a way i mean tragically i give it that because i was so yeah i mean after after the first time i saw it i thought well maybe you know often put, i i often have bad days at the mm. cinema where i sort of see something and then mm. I'm not fully engaged for whatever mm. reasons. And I thought that would happen, but it actually got worse <laughs> for analysing it more. It's so don't watch it again, Mum. Don't watch it again. <laughs> no, 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 I won't. Oh, well, there you go, guys. Tell us what you thought. Did you enjoy it? Did it stand up to the towering performance that he gave us and directorial performance he gave us in A Star Is Born? Or was it just a bit of a... It was just all a bit too prim and proper and neat and tidy?